Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. I think most people in the industrial world know the name SKF. We're a fairly big and, and well-known company, uh, Svenska Kulaga Fabriken, so the, the Swedish ball bearing maker. So now we're going to talk to you about some other subjects that were also dear to our heart. Um, we decided not to do a big introduction to SKF. I think most people know us, but uh, from a business model in the marine industry and many other industries, you make an investment. You decide to build new ships, you take a capital investment, and you spread that cost over some years. You then put those ships into operation, and you are now paying your operating costs, which may vary depending on the efficiency, etc. And then you go to work, earning a revenue. The idea is you get a payback point, and you make money. And I think the Greek community have been very good at making money from, from Marine over many years. Um, unfortunately, Things happen. Systems fail, important equipment has an issue, and we may have a downtime instantly, an unplanned event. Uh, that can result, in the worst case, in off-hire, uh, and we've seen some very big showstoppers that occur occasionally. Thankfully, not very commonly, but, but they do happen. And you then incur the increased cost to repair and restore the function of that ship or that system, or you have to replace the ship with another ship while you fulfill your contract. So the original business model shifts, your pay back point moves, and in fact, you may or may not be making any money. So maintenance and operations, and technical management, is extremely important to the overall operational efficiency of the ship. We can see the direct impact of around 10 to 15 percent of the operating costs of a ship are in maintenance, repair, and, and, and overhaul. But there are also indirect effects like spares. Uh, I would say here, when you, with the use of condition-based maintenance, you replace the bearing, not the gearbox. And you have a big consequence in terms of uh, spares and other such costs. Again, around the region, around 10, 15 percent uh, reduction in spares. So all these things relate directly to operational efficiency or asset efficiency. In practice, we find that if we take, there's around about 100,000 class ships in the world, the vast majority of the marine industry is still working on a very prescriptive maintenance regime in continuous survey or, or machine renewal cycles. For good reasons, for good safety reasons and, and uh, you know, to make sure we're running uh, effective vessels. But in practice, that probably uh, uh, results in too much maintenance, too much intervention on machines that are actually working well. Uh, the more advanced fleet managers are moving progressively towards PMS notation, giving them to a more controlled environment. And you'll, again, not to preach to you guys, you know that very well. Uh, very few companies today have an appro a class-approved CM program uh, because it takes time and effort to achieve it. You have to have very good discipline, very good processes. But we know that more like 10%, 15% of ship managers are actually using condition monitoring as a diagnostic tool, but don't have a class approved process. So we see that trend improving, and that's why uh, we're in the business of providing that. When we look across the world of marine, okay, a busy slide, we see already the trend happening, that the OEMs, the major propulsion manufacturers, engine manufacturers, are starting to integrate condition monitoring into their products. And that's a very positive trend, and one we'd encourage and support. The, uh, the shipyards, some of them are starting to get into this, but we still see a major gap in knowledge, uh, in shipyard knowledge of condition monitoring and how to apply it. But the fleet owners and operators are where the real pain occurs and where, who, where's the driving force behind this uh, development in the industry. And in our view, it, it has to start with the end user, start with the owner and operator who drive the specifications for such systems. Condition-based maintenance is not a technology. That's condition monitoring. It's non-destructive non testing by various means. Condition-based maintenance is a process. It's a deliberate maintenance strategy. So you have to start with understanding what you're going to measure, which machines, and why. And many people start at the wrong end. They buy technology and then try and apply it, and it doesn't actually give them the results they want because they're measuring the wrong things in the wrong way. Once you've designed your strategy in the right way, including, and it does not replace planned maintenance, it may supplement 
plan maintenance and replace some of it. Then you can design the system, the data collection, uh, and remote analysis is now becoming very popular uh, because of the increasing bandwidths, but we still need to be able to transmit data to and from ships in low bandwidth environment. And so we work typically in about the 120 to 200 kilobyte a second area. So we're not expecting megabyte lines to do this kind of work. All of that is money. Up to that fourth or fifth point, you've just spent money. But on the, f on the fifth point of correction, you actually start making benefits. You, you actually know uh, how to make corrective actions in the right way, planned interventions. And in the longer term, you learn from it and, uh, and maintain and improve in a better way. And I'll give you a couple of examples. As I said to you, the first and major problem uh, is that people are faced with a lot of vendors selling kit technology. Now, some of it's very good, some of it's less good, but it's a confusing environment. Should I do this with a portable instrument, online instruments? Should I be doing vibration or thermography, oil analysis? You know, it all seems too difficult, too, too, too difficult to, to take on intellectually and, and, and in a cost-wise. Also, of course, the marine industry has particular drivers, like the fact that the, the crew is changing regularly. How can you do that sort of work on board? And that's why remote monitoring has become much more popular. Um, grease and oil analysis is as applicable to fuel oils and lube oils as much as, as actual machine condition. So, so all these things apply in different ways. Uh, we're fortunate in SKF that we own and manage all these technologies, so we can give an independent view on what's appropriate. Again, the strategy is usually to do periodic monitoring on machines where we have progressive and low failure rates where we can monitor machinery uh, on a periodic basis, maybe three or four times a year, maybe six times a year. We move up the scale to more critical equipment where we apply online systems, especially where you've got variable speed, variable load, variable, opera variable operating conditions, which you can't predict so, so well. So you need more intelligent systems. And you find in the naval sector, uh, gas turbine equipment, things like this. Um, the other thing that's developing and is now here in the world of marine is internet-based monitoring, where we're moving things into the cloud. Uh, we're all doing it with our iPads now and the iCloud, and those, but it's coming into marine. Uh, Tablet-based devices, cloud-based information systems. So we have to be ready for that. That's the next generation. Uh, we are testing those systems currently with fleet managers. That's the, that's, and this moves all the technology off the ship and puts it into the cloud. Uh, puts the database in the cloud. It's a very good move, again, uh, but we have to deal with the IT and communications constraints that come with it. It improves the quality, the overall quality of the program. Um, as an example, this is one fleet manager we work with, where we're monitoring around 50 ships, and there's 5,500 machines being monitored every year by, by uh, remote diagnostic teams. Their crew collect the data on 12,500 measurement points. Now, that sounds like a, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, problem, but in fact, it's, we've been doing that for the last eight years now, very effectively. The first place you start is by understanding what's high, medium, and low critical. Which machine should I monitor every month? Which ones should I monitor every two, three months? Which ones every six months? And by doing that upfront analysis, you get that insight into how to, uh, how to set up the program I won't go into the detail of that, it's, very it's a complex consultancy service in itself, but uh, by segregating the, the assets, you get into that, that right region. What we find as a result of this sort of activity over a period of five, six years, this fleet operator is now able to say that around 20% of his machines are high critical out of those five and a half thousand. And for those high critical machines, he applies OEM maker's recommendations and CBM. For the medium critical, which is around 50% of the machines, they actually reduce the OEM maintenance and, um, and use CBM as a signal to do plan maintenance. And for the low critical, we virtually throw away the rule book and move to a, to a pure inspection basis because uh, um, there's so low risk. So it's all about the process, understand the system, understand the components in the system, understand the maintenance practice that you're going to apply, planned and predictive, and performance monitoring. Then we know what right the data to collect, and we know 
how to make the right uh, judgments on that machine condition. What we see in practice is that for that fleet manager, for instance, around 1,400 maintenance recommendations a year, 40% uh, are invasive, 60% non-invasive. So we're actually doing better maintenance. Uh, we can demonstrate return on investment at least 200% and more on that activity, which is very, very good and, and embeds it in their organization. And of course, for us, we get sustainable revenue and, uh, and uh, opportunities to sell more. Um, there's a wide range of technology in the market. Again, I don't want to go into that, but they breaks into three main groups, portable, fixed, and intelligent online systems. And there's two types of services. There's one where you put a guy on board the ship, the specialist, and you get the one where we're doing remote monitoring and support, which is much more in line with class pr approved processes. Uh, the other problem in the marine industry is, of course, that you're global. So it's very easy for, for specialist companies to engage locally. So we try to be local and global in that sense. So we try to have specialist teams placed around the world, but in a connected network. And uh, that then enables them to work with different fleet managers of different types. So you should look for those attributes if you want to go into this area. And just our final bit, okay, we today you can see around about 700 ships uh, using with SKF technology, but there are many more than that with, uh, with a number of different vendors. And, uh, but we see that area growing, and a growing area of interest. So thank you for your time.